Welcome back, everybody. I hope you all have had a great week, great day, great night, or whatever um, time period best suits your situation. Uh, I'm Micah. We're here uh, playing some Daggerfall Unity as usual, and uh, I'm I'm simply excited about uh, playing Daggerfall. I feel like it's I, it's probably been like a week or a little over a week, but man, I'm pumped um, for numerous reasons. Uh, let's start things off by talking about the end of the last episode. I was a bit, like, fatigued from, um, I guess just from playing so much Daggerfall, but also from, uh, the, the questing, the overland travel, and the tech issues, man. I've mentioned before how I get a little, like, I'm not very motivated to solve my own tech issues because of, uh, how I work in the tech industry. It's, uh, or I, I do tech support nine hours a day, so like I don't want to do it for myself often. Um, so we were doing this awesome quest that was added probably by um, JH's quest pack one. And uh, we got to a point where we could not interact with an NPC where we needed to interact with whom we needed to interact. So um, I did some troubleshooting and some finagling with some. Uh, quests and it just wasn't happening or not some quests but some mods it just wasn't happening so we just ditched it all together man I, I made the executive decision as hard as it was to uh, get rid of not only JH's quest pack but also basically any other uh, custom quests that are not warm ashes and I think there might oh yeah the custom quests related to the bards guild I left in just because like we won't be using it with this character anyway um, you know, you hate to see it go because, um, JH and Cliffworms, they've added a lot of fantastic content, um, as far as quests are concerned, but you know, man, I just want to keep the, the tech issues to a, as close to a minimum as we can in this playthrough. So yeah, unfortunately, uh, had to say goodbye to that because I, I don't want you all have to have to deal with me figuring out my mods. It's happened like almost consistently from episode to episode where I have some issue with mods or another. And, you know, I just, I don't want to put myself through that. And I, and I don't want to put you kind, uh, loyal viewers through that. So we're, we're just cutting out that little, um, cutting out the room for mishaps to occur. Um, so yeah, here we are. We are in Shalgora, Shalgora. We're just going to probably lose some reputation with the Thieves Guild, I'm guessing. Uh, I don't know, it's still at 14, but we'll see. Um, we were in Shalgora, Shalgora. I went ahead and bought a second water skin because we literally almost like died or at least almost had to teleport because of being near death because of... Uh, I found out that I don't really think about my water supply with climates and calories that often, you know? It's like I'm often going from town to town and just going to... Um, I guess the third time that we've drank from our water skin. Are we overheated right now? Dude, whenever I booted up the save game, it told me that um, the cold air was numbing my skin. And so this is why we're, we're drinking so much. It's a little too hot. Uh, let's see how we do We should dress lighter still. All right, man. What if we go... Are, is the cold air going to numb my skin? All right, whatever, bro. All right. I'm confused. Um, okay, so housekeeping stuff aside, we are we picked up an extra... Ooh, open oh, both berries. We picked up an extra wine skin or water skin, I should say. That way... Whenever we're not stopping at um, taverns, and we are instead like uh, just picking up food from general stores and traveling that way, we'll be a little less likely to run out of water and die. Um, so, extra water skin for that. Something else I'm excited about is uh, I booted up my computer just moments ago, and I um, was in the Lysandis' tomb Discord server, and I noticed that a a mod was just dropped called. Beautiful cities of Daggerfall. I'm like, what the hell, dude? That sounds awesome. Um, and so I'm just pumped to see what that's about. Uh, you can tell already that we've got a little bit of this going on. This pocket of like the town square is almost never out here, like in the corner. And the look at the the layout here. Um, yeah, you, you never see walls that are s situated like this. So I'm I'm very just. <laughs> It's almost sad how excited I am about this little update, but man, this is so cool. This is um, this is one of the things that whenever you think about how Daggerfall is procedurally generated and the negative aspects of it, the samey feeling of the city is, is just one thing that comes to mind. And uh, I think this is a much needed overhaul. I wasn't even expecting it, so it's 
Look at this. We walk outside the city gates and we've got farmland outside. We've got a couple of um, houses. Uh, so yeah, right now we are in Shalgora. But I think after we do a little bit of sightseeing, we are going to make our way back to Coegria. Uh, in Coegria, we are going to do some Thieves Guild quests. Uh, it's kind of... Coegria, if you haven't noticed, it's kind of like our, a home base for our character. It's where I like to do our regular... Um, faction quests and things like that um so we'll do some thieves guild quests maybe a fighter guild quest uh, maybe we'll see if we can get our reputation up to 20 in both guilds uh, at least one quest for each would work um and then after that i figure like depending on how late it is over here um yeah depending on how late it is over here we're gonna go check out more gaia's quest do a little bit more of the main yeah this is this is beautiful do a little bit more of the main quest. In fact, I think I'm ready to set sail now. So let's go to our uh, menu here. Let's let's see. We are in a port, right? I think we're already considered in a port. So uh, let's go to Coegria. Let's filter by ports. And let's go ahead and... Uh, yeah, we, we're uh, sitting pretty on our money situation too. We have uh, 1,300 gold and a... Um, a hefty amount of jewels, gems, and like uh, a holy dagger in our inventory. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> as we arrive in Coegria, a stalwart young woman wearing the livery of Daggerfall presents you with a letter. Turning sharply, she mounts her horse and rides away. I wonder if this is Queen Abakai being pissed off that we failed our mission. Bogard Masterson, greetings and salutations. I hope your trip was uneventful. They say that you are keenly interested in the haunting of Daggerfall. My father and King Lysandus were somewhat close. Should you visit me, I might be able to shed some light upon recent events involving Lysandus, Prince Lotan, Castle Sentinel. Okay, so this is another main quest. Um, quest. I, I gotta find a better way to phrase that. Like, I gotta find a better way to phrase that. Main quest, quest. Um and turn down my mic audio sometimes because I think that spikes so loudly that it stops registering for a second. Uh, anyway, so now we have a bit of a an option. We have three options for the main quest in front of us, actually. We have um, Morgaya, who has contacted us. We have um, Prince Lotan here. Uh, something interesting about Prince Lotan's quest is that I believe there are a handful of dungeons it can send you to so it doesn't send you to like a main quest dungeon it's just it's going to send you to some place in sentinel um and that's kind of exciting because it, it provides more variation than like we're going to go to more gaia's quest i'm going to know exactly where to go and what to do um anyway yeah let's let's we're, we're not going to worry about that for now let's do a little bit of questing let's check on our temperature it's a mild and sunny day so being shirtless is still the way to go all right look at this place beautiful so Coegria has probably changed, or it certainly has changed since the last time we were here. Uh, but it looks like, yeah. Um, not. I was wondering, like, what's our our like map markers? Are they are they still going to be accurate? I'm honestly not sure at this point. Um, given the way that the land was shuffled around, it looks like the tavern, the thieves guild, and the marketplace and stuff like that is still accurately named. I'm not so sure about these asterisks over here. Uh, that seems to be stuff that perhaps should have been in the market, but didn't. I don't, I don't, I don't know, man. I'm not going to pretend to know what happened. Uh, but yeah, let's go to the Thieves' Guild. So, uh, yeah, regarding those quests of mine that were broken, this is not the first time that a custom quest was broken. I think I might have cut it out in the previous episode, but basically we had a little minor quest to go hunt down some bandages for the Fighters' Guild. They... They're like, hey, this is routine menial work, but you know, you'll get um, you'll get paid for it, and you'll get some reputation out of it. Do you want to just do it? And I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll just do it, bro. I went to a pawn shop and picked up some uh, bandages, and then I I was unable to turn the quest in, and I went to um, you know the local Discord server where all these helpful modders will help you kind of troubleshoot what's going on. Um, usually it's user error, but they like straight up like asked for my save file and dug into the uh, nitty gritty of the programming behind it and found that one parameter was not matching the parameter that should have been thrown there. Like, um, and that was just causing numerous issues with that quest. Uh, I did not ask for tech help this time. I just kind of assumed the same thing was happening, that there's an issue with my game or my save file that I don't really know about. 
Um, I guess it wouldn't be the save file because we have a different character now, but we're experiencing the same issue. Oh, let me unequip my bow. Um, we're going to go to third person mode. Yeah, we are not Kirstia anymore, yet we were afflicted with the same tech issue that afflicted Kirstia. So you know what? We're just going to say to hell with it. The vanilla quests were fine. I liked the new ones, but you know what? We want to have a, a uh, seamless experience here. And so we're going to do what we have to do to be conducive to that. Let's get our quest from our Thieves Guild buddy over here. Listen, Bogard, we got one of our family who's in trouble. You got a couple days to help out one of the family? Yeah, man. Good, Breton. One of our best cat burglars in Ald uh, Aldcester is holed up in a rat trap called the Green Wolf. On her person is a hot stone which she lifted from the palace. Now the word is that someone saw it on her and that the guards are casing the place. Uh, out of respect for the owner of the Green Wolf, they're waiting seven days before moving in. Get over to the Green Wolf and give... Whoa... Um, Christavira Buckingsley, this hunk of gold in exchange for the sapphire, and then you bring it back here. You understand? Good. Now hurry. There ain't time. So, um, okay, it's an Aldcester. It's the name of the settlement we gotta go to. And, uh, you know what? I think we will go ahead and go to the Fighters Guild and pick up our quest there. This is something that we do in real life that I like to try to do. Uh, the Queen's Huntsman. That seems mislabeled. Um, this is something that we do in real life that I like to try to do in Daggerfall sometimes where we consolidate our errands or consolidate our quests. Um, so like maybe the dungeon that the Fighters Guild sends me to is on the way to Aldcester. Uh, either way, this should take, like, I have seven days to do this thing and Coegria is a pretty small region. It's part of what, um, attracted me to it as a sort of home base setup. So, uh, let's go ahead and try not to run anyone over. I think this auto run feature is like a lot. It's making my horse sprint, so I'm a bit worried that by going into auto run, I'll kill someone or assault them. Uh, yeah, this looks like it. Is it locked? No, we are good to go. Uh, my name is Dunan Hearthwing. My master has asked me to find a brave adventurer for a dangerous mission. I cannot tell you any more, other than that they say it's worth over 324 gold pieces to whoever succeeds. Are you interested? Uh, no, nah, man. I only work for the guild master. Thank you. Uh, I am Gordon Masterhouse. We have a request from a local citizen. It seems a wild animal has gotten into his place. We need someone to go kill the thing. Alright, yeah. Sign me up. Okay, we're going to the mastering residence. Um, you get it down in one day. Nobody wants an animal left roaming around their place. Uh, come back here when the beast is dead and I'll have your pay waiting for you. Uh, hey, what kind of animal is it? The mastering residence? Uh, it's a tiger. All right. So we're going to the mastering residence. We're going to put down a tiger real quick, put him in a good choke hold and, um, see what goes from there. And speaking of, um, choke holds, <laughs> uh, Hold on, let me get the directions to this house before I go into one of my random tangents. Uh, yep. Uh, he doesn't know where the mastering residence is. Alright, thank you, it's on the map. Where is it? Oh, it's just, it's pretty close by. Yeah, so speaking of chokeholds, I once hosted a, an online game of 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons back whenever I was just dabbling my toes in OSR, but... Um, had I was failing to find a reliable group that I could play with, and so I was like, you know what? I love my little setting. Uh, wait, what the hell? A guard is here to help out. Hey, guard, come on, man! I got this. Don't insult me. Don't insult me, guard! Come on. Let me through. Let me in. Um, this is kind of awkward. I can't really get past the collision. Uh, guys, I've got it under control. The, this is the fighter guild, fighters guild money. All right, come on, this is our contract. I wonder if I leave and come back if the guard will have moved. All right, I outbrained you. All right, yeah, no fear for this saber tooth tiger. We don't even need to, you know, bust the bow out. We'll just take it down. We'll take its tooth for good measure. Uh, yeah, you'll want to go ahead and take care of uh, the mess in there, alright? Thanks, lady. Uh, yeah, so I enlisted some random dudes. They were... I don't know where I found them, actually. Maybe they were a group looking for a DM. 
Or maybe I was just posting about Bosba, the city that I like to run my games in in 5th edition. Um, on the looking for group subreddit and um, they just like already had a good to go group. I'm like, oh, cool. Well, let's do it. Anyway, these guys were pretty cool in that uh, the entire group was martial characters, which is just like a dream for me. One of them was technically a cleric, but he wasn't really much of a cleric. I won't, I won't get into that right now. Um, by the way, since you seem to have so much fun with that beast, here's a map of... Dude, uh, hell yeah. He gave me a map. Shit, that's awesome. Okay, hold up, hold up, hold up. Uh, am I capturing my screen or my... Yeah, I'm capturing my screen. That's fine. All right, let's uh, see if I can navigate my... Uh, uh, here, uh, Daggerfall stuffs. This is awesome. How unexpected. Going to uh, Castle Kingfield. All right, buddy. Uh, yeah. Boegria. Uh, Castle Kingfield. Yeah, this is great. We'll get to just keep uh, King filed. <laughs> King filed as taxes. Okay. Uh, now we'll just be able to keep an eye out for uh, this dungeon as we are going to Alcester. This is... Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so this is a group of young men who are just all about being marshals in um fifth editions dungeons and dragons and i just ad i admire the hell out of that because uh well you, you've you've probably noticed by now i kind of have a tendency to play only like fighters thieves um non-magic classes so they had like a barbarian a fighter perhaps a second barbarian and then like a a, a cleric who played sort of like a paladin um but yeah it was a pretty good time uh, as usual, I this is my tendency with tabletop games that are not in person. I will lose interest for one reason or another, but these guys were like, um, they really made use of Bosba as a setting. It's a city of scoundrels and thieves that I just adore. I have a bunch of like stat blocks and campaign stuff that I'm sitting on that's for 5th edition that I, I really just need to type it up and uh, publish it already because I... It is so many stat blocks and stuff that I'm not going to use. I'm going to convert it to a, an OSR system one of these days. But anyway, um, the the idea of putting a tiger in a chokehold reminded me of them uh, because I have like this these house rules for grappling mechanics where if you have successfully grappled an enemy, you can do like an athletics contest to um, you know give them a good old suplex or slam them into a wall or something like that. And if you, you know, if you win the contest by, let's say, five points, it'll do D6 damage. And if you win the contest by another margin, like eight points or ten points, it'll do like D8 damage. And this made the game just like so fucking cool. Um, but man, I honestly, I used to think that casters were broken in fifth edition. But then whenever you have a like a party of well-statted fighters going around, they just like they steamrolled everything, man. <laughs> Well, let's look up where our stuff is. So we're looking for... Uh, Castle Kingfield is the dungeon that I'd like to check out. We're actually pretty close to it already, so that's good. Um, the place we're going to is Aldchester. Or Aldchester, however you want to pronounce it. We know that place. Um, uh, you know what? We should probably just be good to our guild and... Um, oh, there's no path. There it is. We should be good to our guild and just like go take care of um, the mission. And then we'll go to the dungeon on the way back. Yeah, so these guys were steamrolling every encounter I threw their way, and this was a bit... Let me save. I don't want to fall through the map after doing a little bit of progress. Um, I had a bit of a dilemma on my hands because of how powerful this group was. Um, you know, it's either I hand tailor an encounter to contradict their strengths by having, like, a lot of casters with paralysis magic... Or just a lot of casters in general who will be able to like impede them without um, letting them close the gap, close the distance so much. But I'm not really fond of that style of... Uh, have you heard of the concept of uh, the Quantum Ogre? Uh, the, the Quantum Ogre is like whenever you have an encounter that you really like, and so no matter what the adventurers do, they are going to run into this encounter. It used to be something I did a lot whenever I, uh, like, before I got into the habit of playing uh, OSR games or old school D&D &D games, but um, I I don't really like the Quantum Ogre because it 
it uh, it's not very friendly for like the from the perspective of player autonomy and having their actions lead to their own like emergent narratives. Uh, you're imposing your own narrative on them whenever you use the quantum ogre, whenever they're going to find this group of wizards that would counter them at every turn. I, sorry, I, remind me to keep talking about this after I read this little blurb. So a knight appears from the east and waves you down. Hey, I'm looking for an outlaw in this area, a cat burglar who's been causing chaos in the nearby villages. His name is, uh, not knowing the man in question, you shake his head. All right, very well. May Julianus bless you. All right, buddy. I hope it's not me. Um, anyway... Quantum Ogre, um, it tends to, it doesn't necessarily railroad players or anything like that, but it limits their options some. Uh, I wonder if I should go try to, maybe limiting their options isn't the problem. Um, but what I would like is for the game to not revolve around the player characters, but instead to exist organically around them. And so whenever you, the Quantum Ogre method of dropping encounters in front of your players is used, um, you're, you're not really allowing the world to be a living, breathing thing around them. You're, uh, yeah, it's almost like, I wouldn't say it's exactly like level scaling is done, how it focuses on the player too much, but yeah, the uh, Quantum Ogre style of Dungeon Master, uh, Dungeon Mastering, I don't know. That, that method isn't for me anymore. So instead of just like throwing these guys at casters because they would be like the... Um, the paper to their, uh, no, papers to their rock. Um, I just kept coming up with encounters that I thought would be cool and that, you know, if a different group of adventurers ran into them, it would be cool for them too. Um, wait, did I just, did I just go back to Coegria? Damn it, Bobby. I got all turned around at the intersection up there. Um, let's see. Yeah, there was this one really cool encounter where I, I had a dungeon that had like a uh, a pool of water and um, above it on a, a higher floor was a like a round area that you could like push people down into uh, the pool of water from. And uh, they really abused that, not abused it, they used it to their advantage. Uh, it was cool, you know, they're, they were using the... Uh, the game space that I created for them to their advantage, it, it worked out really well. Uh, but man, they were just, they were just unstoppable, man. Um, they were cool guys, but eventually I was like, this happens quite often with me. It's like, I, I have to make a decision about how I want to use my time on this earth. And I was already not really loving fifth editions, Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm like, um, do I really want to continue doing this thing that I don't really like with my time just because I like these guys? Um, or do I, you know, go try to find something that I do want to do with my time? And uh, so, unfortunately, I had to turn those guys loose and let them know, like, hey, I, or do you want to play an OSR game that didn't really fly with them? And because, uh, of course, if it's not what you're into, it's not what you're into. Um, it, it's just a bit of a bummer. I wish I would have found them, like, two years earlier whenever I um, was still super excited about 5th edition Dungeons and & Dragons and, uh, you know, we could have had a pretty good thing going, but uh, tastes change, people change, I change, that sort of thing. Uh, let's go ahead and get some food in us. Some goat's milk, that's not what I meant to grab. Come on, man, give me some ale, thank you. Uh, it's nighttime, but I think we're gonna keep traveling just because of our little mishap earlier. All right, so we're facing east. Uh, let's see, where should we go? Should we just go out into the wilderness? We don't have a ton of food for going out into the wilderness, so let's um, let's try to get over here to the. I don't know where to go, honestly. I'm just gonna try to find the road to the uh, the east of us. A group of hostile foes have interrupted our travel. Uh, Lantern has no fuel. We can change that. Okay, hostile group of foes. Hey, cool. It's a bunch of, like, humanoids. Let's go to dialogue mode. Not impressed by our streetwise. Not impressed by our streetwise. Um, nope, nope, nope. Okay, we are not pacifying any of them. But I want to take them down. This is a 
Mountain Blade style uh, conflict with nothing but mounted riders going at it. Oh yeah, um, little necessary thing for our character is grinding our uh, archery some. Uh, the cold air numbs our bare skin. Hold on guys, time out. I'm going to ride away for a bit and throw a cloak over my shoulders. Yeah, ever since uh, changing my, my groups up a bit, I I haven't really found any steady group to play with. It's just one buddy that like we'll sometimes have other people to play with, and then more often than not, due to scheduling issues, it's just me and my buddy Mason. It's like we're just going to... Uh, one of us is going to control a group of adventurers, and the other one's going to um, be the DM, and that that's just that, you know? And it's either that or solo role-playing for me these days, and I often spend so much time preparing for the solo adventure that I don't play the solo adventure, so that's how that goes. <laughs> I, I've been having a lot of fun playing basic fantasy RPG with Mason, though, and uh, pretty soon, uh, after his characters finish up with the uh, first dungeon in the Morgan's Fort setting... Uh, we're going to switch over to Dolmenwood, because the official release is upon us. And uh, we played Dolmenwood, Dolmenwood with a group uh, most recently, but I don't mind just piloting multiple characters. Uh, this guy had food on him. That's awesome. We lost one of them, but that's okay. Steel Greaves, um, you know, you know that this character should be greedy. Yeah, he's greedy. greedy. Let's grab this stuff. Oh, there's still one left. I thought that I'd lost him or something. Yeah, so um, in the last episode, I talked a bit about like my uh, dwarf character who got covered in ooze and was carried back to town by a like a balloon or something like that. I rolled him up and he had like two HP, so he was not the strongest um, or the most durable, I should say. But I had high hopes for him. I really liked the abilities he could have unlocked, um, you know, with level ups and stuff like that. Yeah, I took down all three of these with only nineteen arrows because I well I scavenged the arrows between them, but. Um, I also made like a, uh, what's a fighter called in that game? I think they're knights. And um, <clears throat> he was fine. I liked playing him because I just I just love playing marshals and I like role playing, uh, the role playing perspective of it. Um, but eventually it got to the point where like, you know, if you play old school games enough and your characters die left and right, you like to have a character on backup. And so I ended up rolling a character who is best suited, f suited for the elf class. Uh, friendly group of adventurers. Oh, this is a good place to camp. Yeah, for those that don't know, in older editions of Dungeons and Dragons, it was not uncommon for um, a race like a dwarf or an elf to be a whole class. You might think that's like kind of narrowing and what you can do with the uh, things, and like that's fair. That's a fair take on it. And you know, uh, I think games like Basic Fantasy RPG, which I'm a big advocate of. They don't force that style of play on you, or they, that's not part of the system. But whenever I see um, a race as a class in a game, that's not really a red flag for me. It just if you start to view your um, your character as a game piece rather than in, like an expression of your personality, or you know something that you're going to write a lot of backstory for, or something like that, um, you're you're a lot more willing to see like what does this game piece do for me if we. Uh, like a wolf snuck up on us. All right. Uh, Y'all mind if I cook this for us? Dungeon meshy moment. Okay. Cook. Anyway, um, whenever you are an elf in Dolmenwood, at least whenever it was based off of old school essentials and not its own system, uh, you would have some very specific abilities. I think they're called glamours, and you would roll for them. I have enemies nearby. It's another wolf. I'll let them handle it. So I don't want to have friendly fire. Okay, let's uh, let's just pack up and hit the road. So I rolled some really good glamours for this elf in Dolmenwood. Uh, so like he was rolling around with um, uh, plate armor and a shield, and I rolled something that let him I think become invisible periodically, and uh, he could also jump through keyholes. And so this, like, created this perfect blend of, like, a stealth fighter. Uh, he was so busted. I think his armor class was, like, 19 or 20 or something like that. So he was just... Enemies couldn't hurt him. He could, like, um, go on the other side and do scouting missions whenever we needed to get through a lock. 
uh, you know, Trist about town, the elf, man, he was so busted. I don't know what it would be like to import characters into Dolmenwood um, that were in OSE. Um, but I'm going to find out. It would be cool to keep my knight and my... Uh, oof. It would be cool to keep my knight and my, uh, you know, elf, even if he's not as busted whenever we uh, start the game again. I really like this tavern, so we're just going to hang out here a bit. You know, uh, a little known secret is that I sometimes I'm worried that I won't have stuff to talk about whenever I'm recording. And sometimes that happens. Like, I actually do just like kind of run low on stuff to say. Um, so I have a little uh, one of my many notebooks that I keep with me is full of what I can just call talking points. It's like, oh, as if you run out of stuff, just talk about this. Man, we're like half an hour deep and I haven't even thought of like looking over at my notebook because I'm just like... <laughs> You know, off the dome, wanting to talk about Dungeons and Dragons as usual. Uh, my loyal audience willing to bear with me through all the ramblings. Yeah, it's it's nice to we just play on Saturdays once whenever I can after my son goes down um, for the night. I um, was really enjoying a game that my buddy Mason and I and a couple others were playing before, but. Uh, the way everybody's schedules lined up was right around the time whenever I would give Hudson a bath or, or his, you know, my wife would do it, whichever one of us would. Um, and then after that, we read a book or two before putting him down for bed. And so whenever I was playing that game, I was like missing out on like these precious, precious, like crucial memories that I need to make with my son. And so it's like, on the one hand, I never want to be the guy that like flakes in perpetuity on a Dungeons and Dragons game because I love playing those games uh but on the other it's like well for some reason my son has to take priority here uh we got a little team of goblins i think we should kick their ass uh, let's do a couple of arrows as they close the gap and then we will stomp their teeth into their brains there we go yep All right. Easily done. Uh, so on the topic, though, of um, OSR style play, race as class and things like that, I. Oh, man, I was about to get on the topic, but then we came upon a place like this. I don't have like I have so many conflicting interests that I've never gotten around to it, but I've I've always wanted to write some quests that involve this guy here. You see this little shrine area that we're at? Let me turn off my hood in case I want to use this as a thumbnail. Uh, peaceful. Yeah, there's there's no way of interacting with this guy. It's kind of a shame. I guess you can ask him, hey sir, can I get some water? Thank you. Yeah, you refill your water. Great. He doesn't really say much and he doesn't have any quests for you. I think it would be really cool if... Um, these guys were assigned a faction based on whatever is like the popular temple of the region and you could get like special quests from them or maybe the temple of whatever is in the area would send you to these shrines uh, as part of a quest. Um, I think that's like a, a sort of backlog item for cliff worms because I've talked about it before but I always thought it would be cool to write those quests. But as you can tell, I'm not the best with um, custom quests. Even whenever somebody else writes them for me, they don't work well. So uh, holding off from that. Uh, but in the last episode, I talked about um, this campaign I had where my my wife and my one of my best friends uh, saved the Wu-Tang Clan in a, a game that I called Ammomancy. It's like a classless variation of... Uh, fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons that takes place in a modern setting that has magic. Lots of kind of set up there, but the gist of it is that the chaos ending of Shin Megami Tensei 1 uh, was canon. And um, that's like, that's all you need to know for Amomancy. <laughs> um, and so I've thought of many times, like, how would I go about incorporating this game that I made as a, like, a hack for fifth edition into an OSR style thing? And I. I do have like a document where I have um, sort of race as class sort of things. And in general, like you're just using the basic expert guide or a book of Dungeons and Dragons uh, for the rule set for the most part. I got to stay focused here. Like I'm sure some of you want to watch some Daggerfall and not just hear me talk. So let's find 
Uh, shit, we're an Altcessor, right? Is it the person we're looking for? Oh, it's a tavern that we're looking for. That's right. What's the name of the tavern that we're going for? Uh, the Green Wolf. Do we already have the Green Wolf on our map? We have a lot of stuff on the map, but not the Green Wolf, it looks like. Uh, here we go. Ah, uh, why the hell would I want to give you directions, Bogard? Well, fuck you too, buddy. Oh, I'm sorry, Hudson, if you're hearing this one, you know, 20 years down the line. Um... All right, well, she at least innocently does not know where the green wolf is. Let's go into info mode and see if we get lucky. That's a dead badger. Oh, man, I'm hot, aren't I? Yeah, I should dress lighter. There we go. Uh, yeah, so... Reflecting on how Ammomancy should be implemented into OSR... Um, in, in my document, I just... Oh, here's the green wolf. I implemented a lot of stuff that's like it makes it seem like a modification of bx basic expert but um reflecting more recently it's like i should retain the things i like about ammomancy and part of it is the flexibility that comes with not imposing a class on the player character or on the on the player i guess uh it applies to both of them uh let's talk to our person here by the wolf bogard you're a lifesaver it turns out someone saw me with the sapphire and they figure it's a stolen gem uh, this hunk of gold will be my ticket out of here. Remind me to buy you a drink sometime. Now hurry back to Mortar and Garriston. Uh, they're gonna be real suspicious if you're not back in seven days. Uh, Mortar... Uh, hold on, where is Mortar and Garriston? Okay, that's just the person that gave me the quest. That's good. Yeah, so, uh, I'll, I should get some... Well, I would say that I need to get some food here, but, um... Sorry if you heard my phone vibrate there. I always mean to keep it on a different area. And I rarely remember to. Yeah, so the idea about uh, implementing Ammomancy into an OSR game is I want to retain... Instead of just blindly copying Basic Expert, I want to retain the things about Ammomancy that made it special for me. Uh, flexibility about how to build your character is one of those those things. So I I took like the list of equipment and stuff like that, and I'm I'll also be keeping that um, in the game. But it needs to be a classless game. That's just that's a kind of stipulation that I'm sticking with here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and cut to the chase by fast traveling to Coegria. We've already seen the way here. Hope y'all don't mind. Um, I think I have come up with like a pretty good system. I'm going to make a couple of characters and do some solo roleplay um, to playtest. And uh, yeah, maybe one of these days I'll play some damn Ammomancy again. Oh, what the hell? Hello. Uh, got ambushed whenever I arrived. I'll let the guards sort him out. Yeah, am Ammomancy's uh, something pretty special. I gotta tell... I gotta say... Um... Ammomancy, right. <laughs> I read this as the Ammomancy retail store and not the Adventurer's retail store. Thieves Guild is uh, down south a ways. I have it on good authority that you have a sapphire that um, Christopher Buckingham so hand it over and you'll go, go unharmed. Uh, yeah, that's not going to happen, bro. That must be why we were attacked. Yeah, there's just like an infinite amount of possibilities of games that you can run using Ammomancy as its system. I, um, I'll try not to prattle on about it too much further, but, um, if you would like to see some of the stuff that I made, like, if you would be interested in seeing it on, like, drive through RPG, like, paying just, like, a couple of bucks for, like, a bunch of 5th edition blocks, or some, uh, Ammomancy adventures that I've already come up with and can, like, sell, like, I still have a bunch of the rules for 5th edition Ammomancy, and we'll soon have the rules for, um... The OSR version. If that's the sort of thing that you're interested, just like uh, interested in, just let me know in the comments. My wife thinks it's like really important to support me in these things. I'm not saying that you should support me in these things, but she's really supportive about it. Um, I'm so like, I've become such a, like a, a workaholic recently that I forget that I'm like creative at heart, and I want to write and create and like make RPG systems and RPG campaigns uh, supplements and things like that. Um, so maybe it will serve as encouragement. Um, who knows? Uh, but yeah, it's sad. I made so many, like, 5th edition materials before just abandoning ship, and, like, a lot of those materials didn't even see play. It was just me sitting alone, uh, like, in my 
dorm room or apartment at the time and I'm like I need something to do with my hands that's not a video game so let's go ahead and you know I have a bunch of gangs for my city in Bosba in fifth edition um I got just a ton of gangs and I built stout blocks for all of them and things like that it's really really cool uh good job Bogard I hear that Christopher Buckinsley showed the guards that piece of gold they thought was a sapphire and they bought her a drink as an apology I tell you ain't no life like the life of a scoundrel here's a, your share of the sapphire uh you earned it all right Ain't no life like the life of a scoundrel. Um, I hope I can remember that to use as the title, but I probably will not. <laughs> uh, Alright, let's go check out that dungeon. Uh, it's going to be to the north of us, so let's uh, yeah, let's go head out this way. Toward a tavern, get a bite to eat, and yeah. Go on to the go on. I'm excited to see what kind of uh, peril awaits us. Uh, so in the last episode, I talked a bit about how I like mowing the yard, and that's still true. Even though I had mowed the yard that day that I recorded, like on a Tuesday, I was mowing it again on Saturday just because, like, it's springtime in Texas with torrential floods all the time, and so it's like the grass is growing like you wouldn't believe. But I think that chores are just something that I've come to love. Um, maybe it's because I didn't really do much around the house whenever I was a kid. Or maybe I'm just happy and grateful to have my own things to take care of. That, that definitely, actually, that, that bit there, I, it accounts for a lot of why I love chores so much. I really like to um, have things that I have the honor of taking care of because there are many who do not. Um, you know, it makes you a bit more grateful for what you have. Like, oh, I have dishes that I can eat. That's great. Oh, I have a floor that I can sweep. This is fantastic. I have clothes that keep me warm and can be conducive to the style I like. Beautiful, you know, it's just like little things like that um, are really great for morale. Let's go ahead and start heading toward Castle Kingfield. A group of giants, a tribe of giants have interrupted. No, thank you. Get out of here. Yeah, whenever I was um, a teacher way, way back uh, in the days of yore, uh, I got stuck on some rocks. I was really hooked on laundry. Like this is whenever I really started getting a fascination for doing laundry. It was whenever I was a teacher, because I would go in and I would do my little like I would call it a nine to five, but it was more like a seven to three job. Um, I was so terrible at controlling the classroom. The classrooms were overcrowded, um, and you know overall I just had it, it was chaotic. I had no control over what was going on or what I was doing. Uh, but you know what you do have control over? You have control over when you do your laundry and you have control over how you fold it. And the, you know, you get to enjoy the warmth uh, of its, you know, the, the fabric right out of the dryer as you, you know, fold it and put it away. And you get to, you get to see the benefits of your hard work whenever you put it all away and you have an empty hamper again. Uh, and I think it was this like yearning for control that made me start to like doing laundry so much and uh yeah i've got some more laundry to do tomorrow those hampers are piling up and you know i'm here for it uh i think uh, one of the great things about working from home is whenever you get a break between tickets or whenever you simply need a break for 10 minutes or so you can step away and uh do some chores this is a uh... i've been in conflict with myself for... oh no not a crash not a crash. You've got this dagger fall. Just hold on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, time to do a quick save. Okay. Something I've been in a bit of conflict with myself about is how much I love to waste my own time. Uh, sign warns trespassers beware. Uh, or ra rather, I just crave stimulation whenever I could live life a bit more slowly. And so... Um, Something that I've been practicing is not always digging for my phone and my wireless earbuds whenever I need to do the dishes or cook something or fold the laundry and instead just kind of let myself be. Uh, it's, uh, it's more difficult than what you'd think. I appreciate all of you who are right now doing chores and listening to me prattle on while I play video games, but... Um, okay, menacing dungeon ambiance. Switch to hand-to-hand. -hand. Anyway, like I was saying, <laughs> I'm going to be quieter so the monsters don't hear me. 
anyway, like I was saying, um, sometimes it's good to force yourself to be reflective. Uh, I think a lot of the times we want to distract ourselves from ourselves, if that makes any sense. Um, and maybe there's something that's been you've been stewing on, and so uh, something's on the other side of the door. Heading back. Maybe there's something that you've been stewing on. Oh, what is this? Oh, it's a barbarian. Okay, I thought it was like a. It was just from uh, the Daggerfall enemy expansion, so I. It was unfamiliar and scary for a second, but we should be able to actually kick in our ass. Okay, we got okay, okay, we got the barbarian down. Okay, dwarven pants. <laughs> That's cool. That this looks like a teleporter. I'm not going to go through a teleporter. I'm just gonna say that right now. Um I'm not willing to risk it. I don't want to use a potion of teleport to get out of there. Um, so if this is the extent, I think this just based off the dungeon block that we're looking at, I think that would be our, oh, dude, I don't want to have to do that. Um, on the other hand, though, I think our anchor is just in Coagria, so whatever, man, we have plenty of potions of teleport, let's just go for it. Ah. Yeah, the scary thing, of course, about going through a, uh, the teleporters you don't know where you don't have your route of escape planned out and uh, i that escape route is precious to me like i don't like giving that up but uh, it's exciting so let's see what we run into so far we've fought a humanoid and a couple of rats so perhaps this dungeon will not be super brutal to us like the previous ones in coagria have been here's the next teleporter i wonder what went through the developers minds to make a teleporter look like a you know a brick wall i'm used to it i like it but like a strange way to represent a teleporter, you know what I mean? Look at that. Okay, I see a wolf down this way. Is there anything down this way? No, okay. Oh, this is a dog. My bad, dude. Just, like, dropped him with one swift punch. We should switch to our bow and use this a little bit. Because leveling up is important. Oh, hello. And the Daggerfall dungeon music is so cool. Okay. Took a rogue down. Oh, he got some oil. That's pretty helpful. Uh, I've been meaning to buy oil, but you know, I, I just have not been very diligent about shopping in my Daggerfall excursions recently. Uh, hello. Actually, let's go ahead and... Uh, I honestly don't remember, but I think we do have Streetwise as a relevant skill. Um, I meant to check earlier, but I failed to. You know, it's whenever you've been away from the game for so long, you forget about your grocery list. Like, oh, got some moldy raw fish. Um, Silver Queers, I'll take it. Uh, Elven Male Spalder, are we still? Yeah, we're still good. Yeah, you forget about your grocery list that your character has going or your shopping list. Kind of forget what your skills are like. Uh... Uh, hand to hand climbing and running. That is just such a. Oh man, I love this character. <laughs> okay, critical, critical strike, dodging, archery. It looks like critical strike and archer are contributing contributing to our level ups there. Yeah, we do have streetwise. It's as a minor skill, so it's not very good, but we have these. Man, we have really solid, like consistent stats in our minor skills. Our stats isn't the right word, but I hope you get my drift. Okay, this one is locked. Let's go ahead and give it the boot. Oh, hello. I was like, oh, yeah. Come at me, bro. This guy looks pretty badass. If this is a barbarian, yeah, barbarian. Barbarians have a huge hit pool. Uh, this is a new formal cloak, and ours is used. I think we'll take that. Barbarians just have like a huge amount of health typically. Uh, I think that whenever you're playing with Mudex or other mods that um, remove level scaling, whereas the humanoids in vanilla Daggerfall would scale to your level, and so their HP pool scales to you, I believe they are kind of assigned a random level, perhaps based on um, what the rest of the enemies in the dungeon are kind of uh, around. Um, so it's less predictable, I guess is what I'm trying to say. 
Uh, whereas if you see like an ancient vampire, you know what to expect if you've played this game for eons like I have. Yo, uh, it's Mithril. I thought it might have been Ebony. That's cool too, though. Uh, I'm thinking we should go back up and rest. Uh, we're a little too late for that. Already found our next target. Okay, let's go ahead and switch to dialogue mode. Oh, okay. That's... Okay. Oh, he's... Wait, Barbarian isn't pressed by my etiquette. What the hell? I did not know a Barbarian would uh, use etiquette. Is that how it is in the vanilla game? You know, I think there was a moment like this in the... Um, in Adventure Arts Mad Genius playthrough where he's like, whoa, I did not realize that they were on the etiquette team, so to speak. Uh, so I'm just living that moment myself. You remember your own revelations more than you remember those of others, I think. We broke his buckler on the uh, that arrow. That's pretty badass. But you know, I just feel like such a coward backpedaling away. Okay, I dropped one of them, so melee combat feels a bit more comfortable. That uh, compulsion to, you know, not want to feel like a coward is going to get me killed, and I welcome it. Uh, that's the right way to die. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and eat some food. Um, in a video game, I mean, that's the right way to die. I'm, oh, what the hell? There's enemies nearby? I thought I just had the option to rest a second ago. All right. Uh, yeah, that's the right way to die in a video game. I'm not sure if I could be that brave. I, I I can almost guarantee you that I would not put my life on the line to fight some barbarians with my bare fists in real life. Uh, depends on the context, of course. If they had my son or something, then like, yeah, I gotta do what I can. Okay, we got training and lockpicking for moments like this, but we're still really messing up. Uh, somebody's busting a door down. All right, let's give them a couple arrows. Okay, they have already closed the gap, so let's switch to our hit fist. All right, here we go. Throw down your weapons, we don't have to do this. Uh, let's see, actually, we do have to do this. She's not throwing down her weapons. Uh, iron mail, get an arrow back. Okay. Let's uh, get a nice little flick on this barbarian. Hello. Man, I, I was so bad at Rainbow Six Siege whenever I tried that game. Um, I, uh, I I guess this is a decent time to talk about how I don't love the trend of seasonal releases for video games. Um, I understand like how they add to the game, but I think Rainbow Six Siege in particular would be way cooler if it just had like maybe eight operators to choose from instead of being like, okay, you've been away from two months, here's six new operators. Uh, and here's how they change the format for you. It's a like, fuck, dude. Uh, give me a break. Uh, they gradually get more sci-fi instead of realistic as the time goes on. It's like, I get that this is how video games are developed these days, but um, I don't have to be happy about it, you know? Uh, let's see. Okay, we're going to... This doesn't feel like a good spot to rest. Can we rest in this room with all the jail cells? Okay, this will be an okay spot to rest. We have a lot of places where people could sneak up on us, but we'll go ahead and uh, drop our campsite. Uh, imagine that I closed these doors and jammed some arrows or like some debris at the feet of them so that if somebody entered, it would wake me up, all right? Um, go ahead and imagine that because I'm not gonna go through the trouble of closing all of them. Okay, let's pack up and keep going. Uh, so I actually have been playing another non-Daggerfall video game recently. It's, I think it's because of the kind of content that like YouTube Shorts and uh, Instagram have Instagram Reels have been feeding me. Uh, but I've had the old Elden Ring bug, and um, this is a game that I never really finished. I never got around to it. I've been a longtime uh, fan of the FromSoft franchises, or I guess of Dark Souls, because I never, I never played Kingsfield, even though I think I'd like them. Um, or Armored Core, for that matter. So, let's say Dark Souls, and, um, you know, including Bloodborne and Sekiro. I really enjoy those games. Um, so, I just would have think that I, I would have thought that I would have finished Elden Ring by now, but, you know, I wasn't super excited about the game on release. And um, 
it was my friends talking about the game that made me really just like take the plunge because I just don't buy sixty dollar games. That's just not like me. Um, but eventually, I, you know, I sucked it up. I bought the game. It, it's pretty fun. Um, I, I'm gonna be a bit controversial here, and I know that I'm stating some unpopular opinions. That's fine by me. We should all love Elden Ring. It's a beautiful game. I was not super excited about it because of how much I love Bloodborne and Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice, if you don't know that game. Um, because Dark Souls has a really great formula that FromSoft does a great job of building upon. Um, it's technically an open world game, but they have like some Metroidvania style of exploration where you get items and stuff to uh, to progress whether that's defeating certain bosses or getting items from certain bosses that you defeat. There's a lot of enemies in this room. I think I'm going to pass it by. Um, yeah, it, basically, it has Dark Souls has a really great formula, and Bloodborne and Sekiro built on that formula really in just a such a phenomenal way. You still have like this narrow open-world exploration that is, yeah, you can do whatever you want, but it's going to be within these confines, and you're going to explore the confines further once you unlock new things. Found a magical diamond. I hope that'll sell for a pretty penny. Um, I actually think I'm going to get lost in this part of the dungeon, so I'm going to turn back for a second. Um, yeah, so with the Bloodborne, they went to the, like this um, Victorian era, era with um, some clear influences from... A lot of classic horror tropes, like, um, you know, you, you have things that resemble vampires. You have, uh, am I going to pacify anyone? No, I'm not, I guess. The rogue can't hear what I'm saying. That's an interesting one. Yeah, uh, this is a lot of enemies around here, but I'm looking forward to, like, wait, what happened? I just kind of either glitched through a wall or accidentally found a teleporter, but thankfully I... Not in a super dangerous area, or that could be really bad. I don't know what happened. Um, yeah, I just... I did it again. Weird. I wonder if that's intentional. I know that there's... Uh, in Dereni Tower, there's a, a teleporter that... It doesn't look like a teleporter. It just, you know, it just teleports you. And it's like, alright, figure it out, bro. Um, so maybe that's intentional, and it's supposed to throw you into a bunch of enemies. Okay, so, Bloodborne. Cool. It builds on the Dark Souls formula really well. It has a lot of flavorful elements to it. It has a Lovecraftian horror and a more traditional Gothic horror. Uh, you have weapons that turn into trick weapons and become really versatile. So even though the total number of weapons is relatively small, the things you can do with those weapons is um, immense. Uh, we found our teleporter. Did we jump through it? I guess we jumped through it. We've explored the other area quite a bit. Hello, Barbarian. Whoa, hello. Let's go ahead and get a potion of healing going. Oh, oh, one mechanic that I love about Bloodborne is Rally. So if you don't know, it's like uh, whenever you take some damage, you'll have um, like an orange bar uh, that represents the damage you took. Um, and then if you attack somebody while that orange bar is there and it's going to deplete back to where your low where your new low health is pretty quickly if you do some attacks while your health is um kind of in that state of having a little extra orange bar there um you'll regain some health it encourages you to be aggressive and it's just a fantastic way of building on the formula um and then sekiro introduced things like um stealth gameplay and death blows uh, where death blows are kind of like milestones that you have to meet while fighting your boss character. Um, and it just, you know, again, they, instead of having like an open world or uh, an RPG that's more traditional where you create the character and you create what their, their, their likeness and you, um, you know, and you build a certain array of stats to represent the character. Instead, you just like, you level up certain combat arts and specialize that way. But you're always going to be Sekiro. You're always going to be saving Lord Kuro or serving Lord Kuro. Um, so it's a bit more narrow in its narrative. And I think that opened up a lot of design space also. So uh, the, the point I'm trying to make about Elden Ring here, all right, bear with me. Uh, Dark Souls has a fantastic formula that has been extremely successful for not only FromSoft, but um, 
all of the other companies that are like, oh, this is great. We love this game. Let's run with it. Um, they built on the formula really well with Bloodborne and Sekiro and created like entirely unique experiences out of it. And then whenever I was first just seeing uh, Elden Ring, it looked kind of like a regression. It looked like um, Dark Souls 4. You know what I mean? Um, you know, they went back to... Oh, look at those level ups, baby. Look at those level ups. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Serotonin and dopamine is off the charts right now. Um, yeah, Elden Ring, whenever I was first playing it, felt a bit like a regression. We found the entrance to the dungeon with that last teleporter, so we're going to go ahead and go out here and camp out and then go on our merry way. I don't think it's very fair of me to say it feels like a regression because... Um, so I've mentioned what Bloodborne and Sekiro specialized in. I think something that Elden Ring built on very well is the multiplayer aspect of the game, uh, as well as exploration. They certainly built on the exploration aspect by creating this huge, beautiful open world. Whether or not that is a good thing is a, a player preference thing. And, you know, based on what I've said already, you can kind of uh, probably get where I'm going with this. Uh, I, I actually don't really like how huge Elden Ring is. Um, this is... Uh, <laughs> This is especially ironic as I open the world map and look at this map that is like twice the size of Great Britain. Um, but the deal is, um, a couple towers up here. I wonder if they have any food. Let's go check it out. Um, yeah. I don't necessarily love open world games for the sake of being open world. I love Daggerfall because I love role playing games and I love the simulationist aspects of it. But there is a time whenever there is so much to explore that you do not feel like exploring anything. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, we're, we have a lot of people to fight here. Let's go ahead and just start uh, shooting them down. I don't even know if we'll make it to more guys dungeon at this rate. Like, I'm having such a good time just fucking... Uh, I've been trying on a personal level to fight the F words a bit. So I, I apologize, people, and I apologize, Micah. Um... Yeah, we're outnumbered. We're not going to bother with this little excursion. Um, yeah, so... Elden Ring is such a huge and open game that I, I I have this approach whenever I've played new games where I do not want to see any content of it um, before playing it, and I do not want to look anything up about the game while I am playing it. Once I finish the game, I'll go back and start looking stuff up to kind of see what I missed and uh, prepare. Oh, we're diseased, of course, from fighting all those rats. So let's go ahead and a potion of cure disease. Um, yeah, it gives me something to look forward to in my second playthrough. And it it's just a... Uh, you're not well. Oh, they poisoned me. Those bastards. Okay. Y'all, yeah, remind me to pick up potion of poison, potion of cure disease. I think we have extras, but yeah, that's pretty dangerous. Um... Oh, we should take off our cloak also. I'd notice that we're drinking from our water skin. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there's a... I think lately in video games, there's been a trend toward open world games as if it is the objectively um, superior way of crafting a video game experience. And I'm just like, I'm not on board with this philosophy. I don't even know if it's an actual philosophy or if I'm simply imposing on it. But have you seen this trend too, where like every video game has to be open world in order for it to be a success? A lot of them do it very well. Um, so it's not even, I think it's a player preferencing more than anything. Uh, but consider how like um, bland at times Daggerfall can be compared to Thief or Thief 2. Um, and you might get a, an idea of what I'm sort of referring to here. Whenever you have a more limited um, design space, the writer has a bit more freedom to engage, or the developer, uh, has a bit more freedom to engage directly with the player, I think. Um, and you're going to leave stuff in certain corners and crevices, and you can reliably count on the player finding those points of interaction, whereas in open world games, they might go overlooked. Or again, you have a little less analysis paralysis from having so many overwhelming, so, like, an overwhelming amount of options such that you don't really want any of them. Um, so this happened a little bit whenever I was playing Elden Ring. Like I got a bit frustrated because I was encouraged 
Like, my friend spelled it out for me, like, hey, man, I know that you like to play video games without using a guide or looking anything up. Um, but we're living in, like, 2022. Uh, game developers expect you to look things up, and we should lean into that because, you know, back in the day, whenever people were playing Legend of Zelda on the NES, people were... There's some stuff that you just could not have guessed. Like, you have to place a bomb in this one specific location to find a dungeon, and... You'd have to waste many, many man hours by yourself to do this without a guide or or without a, a community of people who are doing this little game with you. Uh, it's just a personal preference of mine that I don't look stuff up. And so it's it made it put a kind of a bad taste in my mouth with Elden Ring. Another thing that this looking stuff up thing does for me with Elden Ring is it gives me a really big, a really bad case of destination fever. Um, it's like, okay, well, I want to get the Golden Order seal, so I really need to go to this place that has a Golden Order seal. Do I have that place unlocked yet? No, okay. What do I need to do to get to that place? And then I rush and I rush and I rush and I go as fast and as hard as I can to get to that place and, like, don't really enjoy the content that I'm going through on the way to get there to the fullest. And so, uh, in picking up Elden Ring more recently, I've, instead of, like, seeing the bosses and the items that I want as the end that I'm trying to get to. The end that I'm trying to get to is the experience of the game. And so I'll see each little area that I get to explore as a gift from the developers and not something that stands between me and the next, um, you know, the next boss that I want to fight, that sort of thing. And it's been a lot more enjoyable that way. Uh, one thing that I should mention is that whenever I stopped playing, I was... Oh, I'm on my, let's go to, I'm trying to sell this stuff to you. Can I sell this stuff to you instead of equipping it? Uh, do I have to go to dialogue? I see, oh, he doesn't have any gold that I can get anyway. All right, later merchant. Yeah, I've stumbled upon a merchant in the road and was trying to sell to him, but it, it's not, not going to happen. Yeah, I should mention that whenever I put Elden Ring down before, I was fighting the Godskin duo. Um, and this was before they were nerfed. Uh, their AI was nerfed a bit, I think, according to my friend, who is more knowledgeable about this game than I am. And so I was like, you know what, man? Uh, I'm actually not that good at Elden Ring. I wasn't that motivated to continue playing. So I just, you know, I stopped and I uninstalled it eventually whenever I wanted some more space for other games. Oh, I should go ahead and save because I haven't saved in a long, long time. Um, yeah, I think I'm getting too old and too like covetous of my limited time on this earth to continue playing games like Elden Ring that are intentionally difficult, where my pride tells me not to use summons, not to get help from other people and things like that. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I have beaten Bloodborne and its DLC. I killed the Orphan of Cost like at least twice. Um, I killed the Sword Saint Ishin in Sekiro Shadows Die twice. Um, and I... Ah, there we go. We dropped the map. Okay, let's go ahead and load. Um, we did that quick save at a really good time. Uh, yeah, I I replayed Sekiro Charmless, which means that whenever you are um, deflecting blows, you have to do a perfect deflection with perfect timing, or else you'll take chip damage. Um, so I have to ask myself, who am I trying to impress whenever I'm playing this game? These games that are developed like developed with high difficulty in mind like who am i trying to impress by not summoning and doing things like that like i've already as a younger man i already like finished games that i feel were a greater challenge um than what can be offered by uh, elden ring and so i'm not really trying that hard about the whole honorable do everything without summons sort of thing like i don't really participate with that culture very much these days uh anyway um, so I, I ended up, uh, on my lunch break one day, I booted up Elden Ring and, uh, there was one bro who was hanging out, I fell through the map again, shit, man. I think this might be a consequence of the mod, but, you know, it's a cool mod, so we're just gonna go ahead and fast travel there. Yeah, there was one guy who was, uh, leaving his summon sign outside of the Godskin duo room. It took us, like, three tries, but we got through to him, um... More recently, I've been exploring, I think it's called Michaela's Halig Tree or something like that. It's a really beautiful area. I was about to kill uh, Loretta, this mounted warrior, and I uh, I choked. I choked whenever Loretta had like one HP left. And it was a 
pretty big bummer because I have not done six like it's not even a very hard boss um, but I have not succeeded or come as close to succeeding since that one choke and you know that choke like looms over you after you mess it up um, <laughs> it's like oh if I had just done this I'd already moved on um, so maybe it's time to take a break and go see what kind of place I can explore instead of fighting a boss uh, so yeah, t t tell me about your experience with Elden Ring. Do you uh, do you still love it? Have you played it at all? Um, any any thoughts on the whole thing about open world games? It'll, this will likely be a uh, a rant style video one day about whether open world is objectively better or not. And spoiler alert, you already know my opinion about it. But you know, it's it's still fun to make those kinds of videos, uh, even if I've talked about it some here. Uh, so we have a bunch of armor that I want to sell. It's kind of weighing us down some. We have... Go ahead and quick save. Man, I'm neurotic about quick saving after falling through the map those times. Oh, it would be cool to get some upgraded gauntlets too. We've had these gauntlets for a while. Maybe... Oh, those are identical gauntlets. Let's go ahead and sell, 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 sell. Oh my goodness. Um, 14,000. It's going to give me 6,960 uh, 6, gold. This is really heavy. Um, yeah, I, that's an uncomfortable amount of gold. We should try to liquidate it somehow. I'm not really sure what the play is for that. Maybe it's getting a bunch of potions. I, actually, I, I think that's the opposite of liquidating, come to think of it. Um, potion of teleport. Yeah, why not? Yeah, games like um, Elden Ring, uh, FromSoft games where you're stuck on a boss, it's the sort of thing that can take over too much headspace. It's like, I have 10 minutes, maybe I can boot up my computer and get a couple fights in and see if I beat this boss. You know, I, I really, that's one thing I dislike about, like whenever I was playing Bloodborne a lot, it would really, um, I would spend too much time on that game, man. Um, okay, we've... Yeah, I, I was talking about this before, how like whenever I'm doing chores, I want to be focused and present in the moment instead of thinking like, oh, I need to, I need this stimulation. I I want to get to playing that video game. I want to watch this YouTube video. Um, and so sometimes whenever you're playing those really difficult games or any game really that takes up a little bit too much headspace, it's almost like the game is overstaying its welcome in some ways. Um, we're at a bit of a crossroads here. Do we go to Sentinel to help Lotan, or do we go to Wayrest? We are technically closer to Wayrest on the map, so I think we're just going to go that route. Uh, let's turn on Filter by Ports, go to Wayrest, yep. Um, traveling cautiously is fine, given how much gold we have. We need to get rid of some of it. Ah, oh, dude, we keep picking up food and it gets too ripe. I just want an apple, that's fine. Alrighty, um, time to go meet Princess Morgaya. Uh, yeah. It's kind of at the center of town. I have this a bit memorized. There are... Oh, never... No, I don't. Do I have it memorized? Okay, I, before installing the Beautiful Cities mod... Um, I knew where all the alchemists and wayrests were without needing to, like, get them on my map. Um, they were both on the west side of town. Let's see if they're both on the west side still. Okay, that's roughly where they were, where I would expect them to be. Yeah, I'm still not exactly sure how Elden Ring work. Oh, damn it. How multiplayer in Elden Ring works. I've done it a couple of times, but um, yeah, it, it would be nice to like have buddies to play with every now and then. But you know, it's, my gaming schedule is just so uh, inconsistent. I'm often doing it like in the middle of the day on my lunch break and stuff like that. Um, and the only time I have, like, I barely have time for this. Honestly, like this is, I'm gonna upload this on a Friday at noon if all goes according to plan, and I'm recording it on like a Thursday night. I'm. You know, new season of Bridgerton just came out, so I'm not, like, as compelled to hang out with my wife, because, like, you know, I gave up pornography years ago. I don't I don't need to watch Bridgerton, uh, so um, I'm going to let her take care of that. We'll go back to watching Dungeon Meshi, like, at a later, later time whenever we have uh, 
whenever I'm not recording. Uh, but yeah, I barely have any time for video games. I'm just gonna barely make my own, like, personally set deadline for this one, because this is gonna have to render overnight, and then I'm just gonna do some uh, upload right before my little self-imposed deadline is up on me, you know? Uh, so, Lord knows when I'll actually finish Elden Ring. Uh, someone in one of the Discord servers I hang out on uh, recommended uh, Legends of Grimrock whenever I was talking about how much I love Shin Megami Tensei and, like, blobbers like that. A blobber being, like, a um, a game that... where It's like a first-person dungeon crawler where it's party-based and you can't really see the uh, party very much. They're just in the UI. And that's why it's called, like, a blobber. Because, like... Cause, like <laughs> This group of characters is kind of like a blob rolling around uh, the map, but you just can't see it on camera. It's That's the idea, I think. Um, the game looks really, really cool. I haven't seen much of it, um, but it looks like it's right up my alley. So I'm, I'm kind of ready to be done with Elden Ring, which is, you know, inviting some destination fever into my life again. But I just really want to check out um, Legends of Grimrock. Another open world game that I just wasn't interested in beyond a point was, um, what's that Zelda game called for the Switch? Breath of the Wild, yeah, yeah. I played that game long enough to defeat one of the Divine Beasts, and I, you know, climbed up each of the towers that you need to climb up in order to activate the, um, the map of the area. And once I had done that, I was like, alright, what next? And that, that's all I cared to do. It's like, man, I... I miss the old formula, man. I don't, I don't want to sound too much like a boomer, but I, I miss the old formula. Um, just realized the desktop audio might have been a little too quiet. Maybe I should... Never mind, never mind. I'm just going to put it back down, put it back down, fix it in post, bro. All right, let's see what more guy has for us. You're trying to track down that letter of the Emperor's, yes? There are very few scandals in the Bay of which I am totally ignorant. I could give you some information, but nothing is without a price that I know well. Um, I know a champ. I need a champion who doesn't fear the fire of oblivion. Are you interested? Yep, tell me about it. Soul of the Black Knight, that is a relief to me. Do not ask any questions. Get this letter to a certain high-level sorcerer at the Necromancer's Crypt Scourge Barrow in the Dragontail Mountains. Avoid the rift. If you see it, you have gone too far. They will not be expecting you, and they will not wait for any introductions. The Necromancers feel that death is a reward for the living, not a punishment. Once you have delivered the letter, they uh, they would feel no need to guarantee your safety. It is their way. I need the letter delivered and a response from the King of Worms in my hand in one month um, at the absolute latest. The risks are very high, Bogard. Please do not fail. Okay, I think because the deadline is one month, we have... Uh, like this is a good time to burn another potion of teleport, even though we'd never really used the first anchor. Um, so let's go ahead and... Uh, are we able to get to the roof from here? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this is a nice little view. Uh, again, I'm not sure what my thumbnail is going to be, but this could be a good one. Overlooking the city. Yeah, I like this. Wall Daggerfall makes some, for some very good wallpapers, by the way. Um, all right. Free. Teleport. Anchor. Go over here and adjust my notes. Anchor, way rest, way rest. All right, Scourge Barrow, super far away, so we are not going to even consider um, anything but fast travel. We did not get potion of cure poison or cure disease. Um, I think we still have extras though. Cure poison, I see you. Cure disease and purification, so we should be good. All right, Dragon Tail Mountains. Here we go. Scorch Barrow. Here we go. Our second dungeon of the night. How lucky can a guy get? Oh man, I actually passed a lot of time just now. Um, I should have traveled recklessly. Wait, what the hell? I went to Dragon Tail. Um, our guy is wedding. She wants me to reply back in a month. That was on the thirtieth. On the 14th already, we gotta hurry. What a silly way to end up in the wrong place. Scourge Barrow, you dingus. Wait, is it trying to take me to Dragon Tail again? Hold up, bro. Isn't, uh. 
Scourge Barrow down here? Hold up. Oh, because we had to... Okay, hold up. Scourge Barrow. I think it's because we had ports. Uh, we were traveling by port. Okay. This will still be plenty of time. Um, as many of you know, the path to the main quest here is very, very brief. Um, I think we'll actually explore this dungeon some because I don't do that often enough. We'll go in, we will go meet Metamarco and, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and play in castle music for a second. Give me a break. Uh, we'll meet Metamarco and then we'll uh, just go explore some. Oh, should be the right one. Yowza. Um, interesting and thoughtful little tidbit. This will, this little banner, if you activate it, will give you a teleportation effect to climb out of here in case you didn't bring any recall or teleportation effects with you. And they, like, why would you have a ladder here, right? <laughs> it makes more sense to have a magical item, I guess. Um, hello, zombie. Yeah, give them the old what for. And these are the nerfed zombies, so they're not as much of a threat as uh, what you might have seen at your first adventure to Scourge Barrow whenever you were young playing on a, you know, CRT monitor. Those days are long gone, buddy. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of posts uh, and, and, like, reels and stuff uh, from the kind of channels or accounts that would post liminal space content where it'll say something like, it's 2004 and it's summer at your grandparents' house, and it just shows you a series of images with some, like, spacey music. I don't know how to describe it. Vaguely vaporwave-ish. It's meant to give you a sense of sad nostalgia, and it's like, oh, we're never gonna, we'll never have these days back. Things changed after, like, the mid-2000s or the 90s, or whatever nostalgic period suits your fancy. Uh, I just have such a gripe with this rain. Like, of course, nostalgia is, like, a huge factor in our lives, and I, I'm not beyond seeing the beauty of it. Um, but I, I think that what these people need to do that are like feeling like there's something missing from our current world. Uh, all right, step one: go out there and fall in love, get married, and have a baby. Um, all right, that's all you got to do. It's that easy. Um, well, what what I mean is like those videos that show a nice grassy backyard, and you can hear the cicadas and the birds and things like that it makes it seem like something was different because you were a child at that time and those moments were so beautiful and visceral and special for you um maybe visceral is not the right, right word but um being a child makes things just so beautiful and special like i had the i didn't really think that my childhood was that bad growing up i just kind of had came from a broken home with an un, mentally unstable mom that i lived with all right let's Leave it at that. Um, and whenever I'd tell my wife about it, or I guess she already knows all about it, but back in the day, whenever she was learning about it, she just like grew like so sorrowful hearing about what I went through and things like that. I'm like, no, dude, I had a great time. Because, you know, your childhood is your childhood. It's, you know, pretty special. I skipped through that dialogue box. My bad. Um, he says, very well. Take this response back to Morgaya, basically. His response is cool, too. Done. It's like, uh... <laughs> Like, it's handled, bro. Um, Princess Morgaya just agreed to basically give her first child up in order to marry the uh, king of Hurstholt, which is in the Somerset Isles. So, Mana Marco is going to pull some strings, let that marriage occur, and uh, in exchange, our firstborn child will belong to Mana Marco. Uh, oh, oh, holy shit. Look at this horrible horde. Wow. Uh, I wonder how many of these skeletons I can fight. Um, okay, remind me to keep talking about nostalgia and um, my experience with it recently after I fight this. Um, whenever I was playing my bandit character before Horrible Hordes was released, I one time found a room that had like a pit trap in it and had like four or five skeletons in it. It's not the same amount as what we're seeing here. Um, but it was so cool, like... <laughs> trying to keep them close to the pit trap and then knocking them into it or taking them down one by one. It just feels really good to fight like a huge amount of monsters. 
Especially whenever you don't get killed by them. Okay, we're safe enough to continue my, my rant here. So, my boy Hudson, he's like 17 months old now, just over a year, about almost a year and a half actually. And um, it's very important that instead of using my time selfishly, I focus on like making this guy's childhood like as amazing as possible. Oh my god. Oh shit. Oh man, there is a lich hiding out here. Okay, potion of teleport. What's up, my guy? <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> guys, that was that was ridiculous. Oh my goodness. Well, there goes our horse. I guess we're rich, so we'll just buy another. Um, let's go ahead and set our anchor again, just so that we'll have one set up somewhere. Mother, gosh, dude, that was awful. Um, I should have known. I actually thought like it was weird that we saw so many skeletons without a lich around because. Um, one of the stipulations of Horrible Hordes is that every Lich comes with a posse of skeletons. Um, so I saw the posse of skeletons. I should have inferred that a Lich would be nearby. Okay, uh, back to the bit about nostalgia. I, I try to make Hudson's life as good as possible, as enjoyable as possible. And a lot of this means spending time outdoors with him. Uh, I should have waited to resume my tangent after we got the next story bit. She says, it's done. I'll be queen of first hold. Although I'm sure the engagement will be quite lengthy. Now I promise the information about the emperor's letter. Uh, the letter you seek is in the hands of Gortwog, the warlord of the orcs. He bought it from the thieves guild of Daggerfall after one of their numbers stole it from Queen Abakai. I confess I don't know, I don't know why the emperor sent it to Abakai. The girl is innocent to a fault. And everyone knows that Gothard is not the loyal empire toady that Lysandus was. Of course, my own family. Well, enough boring court gossip. If you really want to find this letter, you should get in good with Minnie Sarah, the former queen of Daggerfall and the queen mother to Gothrid. I wouldn't directly approach her. Start with someone of lower station. Um, this is our hint to go get Sindasa's quest from Castle Daggerfall. I've been kind of not wanting to show my face there after flaking on Queen Apakai's mission. And I think I will go to Prince uh, Lotun next anyway. Worthless torque, thanks lady. Uh, do we still have a... Yeah, we still have a couple potions of teleport. That's good. Anyway, whenever I'm just sitting in the backyard playing with Hudson and watching him do his thing, or sometimes I'll kick a soccer ball around while he does his thing. Um, sometimes we'll draw with sidewalk chalk together, and sometimes I'll pick him up and like run around the backyard and listen to him giggle and stuff like that. Um, Hudson's currently my vehicle to those moments that those reels are talking about or that those people that are commenting on reels are talking about where things were different back then. Uh, you know, sunlight isn't as good these days. I don't, I'm putting words in their mouths. Um, but if, if you want to experience the beauty of your childhood again, just go have a child with someone that you love and raise them like with the fullness uh, of your heart. And you'll, you're going to find yourself... Um, vicariously enjoying those beautiful moments through the child again there's simply no greater joy on this earth um all right let's go ahead and get some food and drink we need to go buy a horse like we could go back to scorch barrow and pick our horse up but you know what he'll find his own way iron hoof served as well let's go find a general store and uh Getting close to an hour 30 here. I told myself that we would do some questing for uh, my guilds. We would do more Gaius quests. Usually I try to get closer to two hours, but you know, man, we've, we've had a good run so far. Maybe we'll just set ourselves up for our next quest. Um, okay, there's our horse. Don't really have a lot of loot to sell. Uh, let's go ahead and buy this bad boy. All right, um, I don't know. I'm going to misspell this, I'm sure, but um, how did he spell it? Ronald, I feel like it shouldn't have an H there, but I'm pretty sure this guy used an H. Uh, Ronald Dino? Am I spelling that right? All right, this is my shout out to my Brazilian commenter who um, really likes Ronaldo, the uh, football player, the soccer player. Apparently... Um, Ronaldo is called the horse, or I, I guess El Caballo, or I think he's from Brazil, so El Caballo might not be the precise word there, but he requested that I name my next horse Ronaldo, or after Ronaldo, so here you go, buddy. Ronaldino, the horse, is a thing. Um, 
sometimes uh, you might say like, oh, this kind of breaks immersion, doesn't it? Well, I don't know, man. It sounds good to me, so I'm going to use it. <laughs> uh, yeah, L leave whatever name my next horse should have in the comments below. We'll see if I get around to it. Uh, the idea is to not have to have more than one horse, right? But sometimes life is like that. Uh, you know, there's a town nearby to the southwest that's is actually one of the weirdest parts about the Daggerfall overworld map is that even, like, I'll just go to the map. What the hell with it? Look how close Wayrest is to this other major city. Uh, it's to the southeast, it looks like. Murwark Hollow. Um, they're just, like, yeah, bumper to bumper right next to each other. <laughs> uh, it's like, why would these two major cities be just around the block from one another. Maybe historically they were one city and splintered off uh, into separate fiefdoms after, you know, a conflict between the nobility or something like that. Uh, all right. Yeah, Murwark Hollow is a pretty cool place. It has like, I don't know, five or six different alchemists in it. And that is my jam, dude. The more alchemists um, a city has, the better, if you ask me. That means the more likely it is for you to find the potions you need. Um, yeah, oh, dude. I was expecting there to be a city gate down here. All right. Oh, yeah. This has been a nice session, though. It's been too long since I played some good old Daggerfall, man. Um... It reminds me a bit of a time. Sometimes you yearn to play these games like in a multiplayer sense. I think uh, Julian Lefay has gone on the record like in between the period of uh, Julian Lefay being like a lead developer and programmer for Daggerfall and old, basically uh, the older Elder Scrolls games. Look how close these cities are, though. It's kind of wacky. He's gone on the record saying that he's he could see multiplayer in the future of Elder Scrolls between like uh, the time of uh, I guess Dagger Falls released in Morrowinds, and so we kind of yearn for it. I don't really care for Elder Scrolls Online. I, I haven't played it and I don't plan to. Uh, but I used to get my fix of playing Oblivion in a f way that felt like multiplayer, just by like my my old childhood friend and I would be on the phone and he'd be playing Oblivion and I'd be playing Oblivion, and that was cool to me. Um, more recently, I mean, it's been years now, but my wife would play Oblivion on our PS3 while I would play Oblivion on my computer, and it, we would just play, like, adjacent to one another in the same room, and I would, it was a new game for her, but one I've obviously played for a long time, and so it was, um, it was really cool to share those moments like that. It's, of course, not the same thing as going and adventuring together, but even... Like parallel play is a big thing for toddlers, and uh, I, I guess it's important for uh, adults as well. Am I shoeless? I wonder if my shoes broke. Man, I'm not finding the potions that I'm wanting. I mean, these are good and all, but I would like some more potions of resist. Um, now, what am I looking for? Potions of cure poison and cure disease would be ideal. But, you know, I'm not going to dig that deep into Murwark Hollow. We've already gone to two places. That's fine by me. Uh, I think in our next episode, we're going to kind of do the same routine as we did this time. We're going to do a quest for the Thieves Guild and a quest for the Fighters Guild. But uh, instead of... Come on, there is certainly a path. Instead of doing that in Coagria, we will be heading toward Prince Lotun of uh, Sentinel. Let's go ahead and get set up there now should be able to travel to uh let's start in this place off the coast Ooh, <laughs> how do you say this bubisidata bubisidata yeah let's go to this little island of bubisidata and see what happens i'm not sure that they will have any fighters guild or thieves guild there but um it could be cool we get a level up of course we got a level up we leveled up so much in those dungeons that's awesome what a way to end the episode okay um again just a couple of steady points here i think we got six points uh it's pretty good a little bit of strength endurance speed and uh, agility 
Uh, a young lad with a rose of way rest embroidered on his circuit appears at your side. He hands you an engraved card and then disappears. Uh, you have ascended to level six. You sense yourself more. You sense yourself more aware, more open to new ideas. You've learned a lot about the Iliac Bay. It's hard to believe how ignorant you were, but now you've much more to learn. Great. Uh, this is the marriage announcement. I'm assuming. King Edwire and King uh, Queen Berenziah, sovereigns of the Kingdom of Wayrest, are proud to announce the engagement of Morgaya, the Princess of Wayrest, to Carodil, the King of Hershold, in the Isle of Somerset. Fantastic. Okay, um, so it's a rainy afternoon. We don't need this formal cloak and this weather, I'm guessing. Uh, let's take a look at our map and see if we have a... Th oh, look at us. We lucked out. We found a little city with a thieves guild. That's awesome. It'd be cool if they sent us around to um, just some in-city quest for us to do without leaving the island. Yeah, let's just listen to the the nice music oh you know what we have all this cash you know what we could do we could get some training that's something we had wanted right hey everybody yeah let's get some lock picking done hey thanks bud spy master we're not ready for them yet yeah this thieves guild looks really good Uh, got a guild job for you if you're interested. Name is Craig. Some guy wants the holy tome lifted from the order of RK. Wow. Uh, sacrilegious, but we'll do it. Okay, here's the skinny. <laughs> you go to the order of RK and the infinite soul of RK. Take the holy tome and bring it back to me. You get the usual guild fee of 501 uh, gold pieces. You got 26 days to put it in my hands. I'm on it, chief. All right, man. Um, it's been great hanging with y'all today. I'm just going to cut it off here. Um, looking forward to seeing y'all in the next Let's Play episode in probably a couple of weeks. This is my ninth one, which means uh, next on my schedule is a more rant-style video next Friday. So let's go ahead and save. And yeah, y'all take care and have a great weekend.